Hey everyone, welcome back to the Career Matters Podcast and this is your host, Nisar Ahmad. If you're joining us for the first time, we focus on career advice for job seekers, freelancers and hiring manage managers and this is episode 110 of the Career Matters Podcast and this episode is part of the Career Expert Series and our expert guest today is Clark Finical. He's the author of the book, Job Hunting Secrets from Someone Who's Been There. He also writes and speaks on the same subject. We will be covering that a little bit as we go along. But before that, I'd like to welcome Clark to the podcast. Hey, Clark, uh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Nisa, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, before we move forward, I wanted to make sure, did I say your name correctly? You did an excellent job. And uh, I have to congratulate you because very few people do. <laughs> no problem. I always want to make sure that's the case because it's important for the audience to know who my guests are, and one of the most important things is the name. Before we get into the actual introduction of yourself, a fun question I always ask my guests is, where are they are calling from? <laughs> I am calling from a little city in Florida called Kenneth City. It's in the Tampa Bay area, just uh, right next to St. Petersburg. And for those of us who are not familiar with Kenneth City, could you share with us a fun fact that people would not know unless they have lived there? Well, uh, Kenneth City was actually created by a, a builder who wanted to avoid the taxes in St. Petersburg. So he created this development and basically the city, nobody would call it a city because of its size, named it after his son. And we have significantly lower taxes than St. Petersburg, which is a real plus. And we actually have our own police force. I'm only actually about eight houses away, which is a, another big plus. So it's very nice. Okay. That's very interesting. It's always good to hear this personally for myself, because I love to learn about a particular city. And one day, just I happen to be there. It's good to have that idea for the benefit of the audience. And also for, it'll help us set the tone for this interview. If you could share a little bit about yourself, your history of how you came about becoming a career expert. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Just some helpful background. I worked for one company for 24 years. And while my job was eliminated four times, I was able to land work in another division three of the four times. And I just don't want you to just think I'm a slacker. And that's why I'm happy to share my salary tripled in the 24 years that I worked there. So a key point that maybe provides some background why all of this was happening is New technologies were disrupting the industry. I was also a part of a, a merger as well as two spinoffs. And so other words, layoffs were common. The person on the other side of the wall could be a hit person down the aisle. In fact, I knew of a situation where the, the next aisle over everyone was uh, lost their job. I saw four different bosses lose their jobs and I know this might be a little bit longer introduction than you do normally, but I thought it might be helpful if you don't mind. Since my wife was raising our two kids and homeschooling them, I read everything I could get my hands on to understand how to land work as quickly as possible. And after reading hundreds of books and articles by HR veterans and recruiters, what really struck me as odd was they all seemed to be saying, same thing. Namely, here are the 76 things you must do to get hired. Over time, I realized I was reading the 76 things HR managers and recruiters believe you must do to land work. And uh, I, I really, as a past job seeker, I really felt sorry for my fellow job seekers. And while some of these tasks that were discussed had value, I really felt like they were missing the most important part. What I really consider the crux of the matter, and namely that's how to win over the hiring manager. That is a, a critical part of what I've written and uh, 
how to, uh, you know, job hunting secrets from someone who's been there. And that's going to be a critical part of anything that I will write going forward. That's very interesting because you said about all the things people have to do, right? Because you always see this, do these things and you're guaranteed a job or do these 10 things. And it could get overwhelming. I know yes. you've also written a book. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along this interview where you talk about job hunting. One of the books you've written is Job Hunting Secrets from Someone Who's Been There. What I really find particular, very interesting, I'm, I love an article you wrote on Medium. I think it's called, let me pull it up here. Uh, it's, it's, it's called 12 Lies Told to Job Seekers. And I'll make sure to include this link in when the show goes up. But there's a lot of things that as I was reading this, I, I, I say to myself, yes, I've heard that. <laughs> and when I thought to myself, you know what, if I've heard that, I'm sure anybody else who's applied for a job has heard that as well. So what I'm going to do, I'll take a few questions from there. I'm going to read that and you can tell me why you think it's a lie and maybe you can provide us more of an anecdote or evidence which, that it, it's, it's not the case. And I, sure. find, I think the audience will find that helpful because to your point, we, instead of going and talking about the 10 things someone can do, I want to flip the switch uh, and talk about all the myths out there or the lies out there and then you can share your ideas. Great. That sounds great, Mr. Nisar. So the first one I saw was... Uh, which is very common, which is job posting says, uh, do not contact the hiring manager. Well, you know, when you think about it, in some ways, that sounds logical. What has to be kept in mind is that in many companies, I might say most companies, HR wants to control the process. They view it as we don't want to bother the, the hiring manager at all. They want to be the conduit, the, the path through which... Uh, they control candidate selection. And one of the key aspects of job hunting today is something called the applicant tracking system. Mm. The almost all employers, certainly almost all large employers, use applicant tracking software to automate their candidate selection process. And the unfortunate thing about these tools is that they reject from 75 to 90 percent of all applicants and they're notorious for misreading resumes so you might have had a wonderful resume but the many ats's frequently do not read the resumes correctly so what is very common then because of that is to get an automatic rejection letter because for whatever reason the ats decided you were not the candidate according to its criteria I actually had that happen to me. I applied for a position back in 2013 and I received a rejection. Actually, the day of the interview, I had already reached out to a friend of mine who worked there basically using the referral strategy. And that morning I got the rejection letter, but it didn't, ma it didn't matter. You know, there's a commonly held belief that the left hand of the corporation knows what the right hand is doing. Don't believe it for a second. I went to the interview and there was never any mention of that rejection. In fact, I was in the, the running for a number of months. So that is what happened with me. One of the other key points is the hiring manager is depending upon HR to make these choices and they're depending upon the ATS software system, HR is, to do this job for them. Once you've been rejected, you have nothing to lose by calling the hiring manager. And if you can craft a concise, well thought out message that will quickly explain to the hiring manager why they would want to talk with you, you know, first your interest in it, but probably largely your qualifications that would make them want to talk to you, it's worth it. And you know, once you've been rejected by the ATS, you have nothing to lose and perhaps a lot to gain. I love what you just said at the end. Once you've been rejected by the system, you have nothing to lose contacting the hiring manager, right? If you have been rejected, why not take that try? Exactly, exactly. I mean, you don't want to tell the HR, oh, I'm going to do this, because they'll tell you no. You just need to know what's going on. Every job seeker is told many things by the people they interact with, but what is not known by most job seekers, and I eventually learned, is that 
everything a job seeker is told is everything that those people want you to do, not necessarily what is in your best interest. That is so true. And moving on to the next two questions, I think they're both tied in together. I'll ask both of them together and you can answer them. One of them is human resources says that only apply to jobs if you have 80% of the requirements. And then on the other side of the spectrum, hiring managers and recruiters say you're overqualified. So they both talk about qualifications. On one side, you don't have qualifications. The other, you have too much. So I would love to hear your ideas on those. Sure, Nisar, thank you. And I think I'm going to probably maybe address them separately be just to kind of for clarity's sake. Sure. You know, when you think about it, when you hear from HR only apply to positions where you have 80% of the qualifications, that sounds logical until you realize or you, until you encounter some of the things I've qualified or I've, I've encountered. For example, I've encountered job descriptions that are one continuous sentence that goes on for, for 15 lines. I've encountered jobs where the hiring manager told me in the interview that he's so busy that he didn't have time to create an actual job description. So this is actually only a template. There have been other times when the hiring manager will tell me, well, they haven't fleshed out all of the job requirements yet. So it's kind of in flux. And then uh, finally, there have been times when I've read job descriptions that look like they're looking for a Nobel Prize winner. You know, one of the key things that, you know, I've realized is that because of this situation, it's important just to make your very best shot and do your strongest cover letter and resume to get in there. Here's a case in point. Back in 2013, when unemployment in Florida was between seven and eight percent, I applied for a job in the September time frame. The description wasn't crystal clear, but it looked like something I could do at a phone interview. And while I did not get that position, because I made a name for myself, because I really stuck out, I was called back to interview when a new position was created. And that's where I work now. And I have, uh, I've had other friends who've uh, basically told me the same thing. So you have to remember, HR's overall objective is colored by the fact that once the internet started, HR is getting flooded by applications. So from their perspective, they want to reduce the number of applications that come in, and that's why they say the 80% rule. And one of the other factors that can sometimes make it hard for job seekers is that many job descriptions have a lot of corporate jargon or company jargon that isn't 100% clear. So, you know, if you can lead with a strong resume and a cover letter with, you know, recommendations, strong recommendations from past bosses, you can, uh, you can make it through or your chances of making it through are significantly higher. Okay. So what I'm hearing is it's HR because they're being flooded with a lot of applicants to make their, it's, it's more of a screening process for them, right? Right, exactly. Uh, just to make it easier for them to go through that process. But what is the remedy? Should they still apply through HR or should they, if they feel they're a strong candidate, even though they don't have all the requirements, could they find the hiring manager's email or on LinkedIn reach out to them? Well, I, I would still recommend applying because there are ways to, uh, to get through, and that's actually one of the things I talk about in my book, Job Hunting Secrets, from someone who's been there, because ATSs are looking for resumes to be formatted in certain ways and in certain order. And by doing that and by also customizing your resume to many of the words that are in description, you can significantly increase your likelihood of getting selected by the ATS system. One of the tools I didn't use when I was in the job market, but has become more recently available is JobScan. And I believe their website is jobscan.io, exactly like it sounds. And they do an impressive job of helping you customize your resume. I think the first five scans are free each month. That's who I would recommend because customizing a resume can be quite difficult. But I believe by doing that, you're going to significantly increase your likelihood of getting there. And, you know, the bottom line is every interview you go into makes you a better interviewer. So if you think this is a great company and you believe this is a job, 
that would be a good match for you, go for it. And even if the hiring managers or HR don't think you're the best match, by being in an interview, you have a chance to stand out. Because I have friends of mine who have been in interviews, and they didn't get the job they applied for. But because they were in an interview, they made a name for themselves. And they said, hey, we have this other open job. Would you be interested in it? So... Okay, that's fantastic because it's still possible to get through that process. And you, what I really loved, what he just said is, every interview makes you a better interviewer. And right. that's so key because a lot of candidates, and trust me, I've been there in the past where you have a dream employer, you think that your life is set if you work for this company, you're, and you go through the process, you don't get the job, you get discouraged. But what, you, what people don't realize is, because you've spent all this time interviewing with that company, you've become sharper as an interviewer. Your yes. interview has become a little bit sharp. So that's an excellent point. Clark, what about the next point? I, want, I would love for you to expand on that. Let's say someone is qualified and they think they're qualified. They even go to the phase where they're meeting the hiring manager and then they're told you're overqualified. And how do you deal with something like that? Well, there are two things to keep in mind here. There are a couple of things actually. And and I mentioned too, I actually think of two people I know who uh, have reached out to me and told me they were overqualified. The, the first one was a woman who was in Australia and she's originally from Malaysia and uh, she was applying for a position and she told me about how she really wanted to work for this company and she was told you're overqualified. And I could immediately tell by what she wrote to me in her message that her English skills were not up to par. And recruiters are, in, you know, in a difficult position. They, you know, it's never easy to tell someone they don't have the skill that's needed. And they know that I'm guessing some candidates might react negatively. So they tell something that they tell the applicant something that they want, they believe they want to hear. They say you're overqualified. But in reality, in this case, her English skills were not up to snuff. And that, so that's why she was ruled out. I have a, another friend who had lost his job and this was an impressive person who was very capable at, at my employer, was very well thought of. And he applied for a position, I think in the Minnesota area. And he was told by the hiring manager that he was overqualified. And knowing my friend who was very tall, had a very deep voice and was very qualified, I personally believe that that hiring manager was afraid for his own job. And that's why he was not going to hire that person. You know, I kind of view the, the overqualified as almost like a, a smoke screen. You know, it's almost sometimes like being told this outfit doesn't make you look fat. And while at face value, that sounds complimentary, but the bottom line, it's hiding a message that the recruiter or the HR manager doesn't want to tell you. Now, in situations like this, what you could do is kind of explain that I understand what you're saying, and I understand that, okay, you think I'm overqualified, you think I would just take this job temporarily and then move on to another job as soon as another offer comes. Here's the time to explain, one, why you like this job, two, why you like this company, and probably three, probably most importantly, with all the disruption we have in today's economy, why you really need the job, and your excitement about it and what you can do for them. And if you, you know, in, in some cases, people will say you're overqualified because they view you as a flight risk. They view you that you're not going to stick around. You just took this job because you needed the income now, but you left. And I've, I've seen people do that. But if you can make the effort, I mean, the bottom line is it's worth your best shot to make the effort. If you really want to work there, then go ahead and explain your case. I mean, I knew someone who reached out to me. I believe had a PhD or a graduate degree of some sort, may have been a master's, who applied for a warehouse manager role because he just needed money to take care of his family. And he asked me, should I have done that? And I said, yes, you have to take care of your family first. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's just the nature of our world. And, you know, so if we can understand these things up front, we can be more educated job seekers and make wiser decisions. That's definitely so true. And uh, th thanks for covering that. Because I think uh, a lot of people are in that situation and they need to know what the solution is. So I think you've covered that very well here. Thank uh, you. 
I want to move on to the next two questions which are related, but it's everyone's favorite or I would say the everyone's most dreaded <laughs> salary. So, and I, I, myself included, when I've looked for jobs, it's something that I've been very uncomfortable, but it comes over and over again. For example, the recruiter says, you must provide your salary history. Is that normal or is, uh, first of all, is that even necessary or acceptable? Well, it's important to understand what's going on. And I guess one thing that might be important to understand as well is a new law that was passed in California this year, where they basically said, you're, you're no longer allowed to ask that question. It's become illegal there. And I know some countries, uh, I'm sorry, some companies are adopting that policy nationwide. Here's what's going on. When the recruiter asks you, you know, for your salary or um, sometimes what's going on is the recruiter is in a position where he has a number of positions that he has to fill and he's always going to have more lower salary positions than higher salary positions. So if he can get you to accept a lower salary position or if he can get you to believe, oh, you're asking for too much, you're unrealistic, he's gonna have a much easier job of fitting you into a position and making his commission than if you say, oh, this is what I made the last time and I expect at least this much. So that's one factor from the recruiter side. When you're dealing with an employer, an employer's top objective is always reducing costs. So if they can get you to take what you made before or maybe 5% more, they are going to be significantly more profitable. Or if you can tell them, if, you know, do some research, you know, and say, okay, I helped someone recently in Tampa Bay who was a wireless engineer. And you can go on uh, Indeed and Glassdoor and find out, like, for example, that the average wireless engineer in Florida makes about 96, 97K and share that with them and tell them this is what I expect, then, you know, if you have many, many irons in the fire and you believe you're in a position to, you know, explain, you know, basically, I guess for lack of a better word, they need you more than you need them, you can tell them this is what I expect. And you can see how they respond. I mean, that's kind of part of the negotiation process, but it's important to remember that when they ask for salary, an employer is trying to reduce their costs. When a recruiter asks for salary, they want to make it as easy as possible for them to make their next commission. So they want to plug you into the lower salary positions. So let's talk about the flip question. The, the, the question that is on the flip side that we get is when an external recruiter says that your salary expectations are way too high, does that also fall under the same principle that you just explained? Yes, exactly. You know, like I said, a recruiter is working for businesses who want to fill empty slots and need to hire people. They always are going to have uh, more lower paying jobs to fill than higher paying jobs. So if they can plug you in, if they can get you to believe that you're asking too much and get you to accept their lower salaries, they're that much closer to their next commission. That makes sense. So let me ask you this question. I mean, just want to follow up. So you mentioned something about on another question, when people have requirements, uh, the cost of living, taking care of salary. So many times people, they know what they want. They probably, let's say they have already done a market research. They know that for the position and the skill set, this is what they could get paid. But when they're speaking to a company, they still get this objection that your salary expectations are way too high. Should they try to continue persuading that recruiter or hiring manager or should they look for another job? That uh, line. Yeah, no, this is an excellent question. And it, it's really, there will be people who will tell you many different things, but every question has to be answered in terms of the context of what's going on. When you're maybe in the height of recession or you're living somewhere where there aren't a lot of opportunities, then, and you're not open to relocating, then you may just decide that the wisest thing to do is to accept their salary. But if you're living, let's say, in the New York metropolitan area or Chicago or L.A. or Raleigh-Durham, and you realize that you have a strong skill set and there are a lot of employers looking for those skills, then it's time to say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to work out together. I would love working for you. 
and you know go on to the other companies. When I, just to some personal history on my part, in 2013, when I uh, interviewed for the role I have today, the hiring manager told me afterwards that she didn't think I was going to accept the job because it didn't pay enough. What she didn't understand was that this was a state that was still recovering from the Great Recession. Unemployment was high, and my contractor position had just ended, and I was willing to take that job. I was also willing to take the job because it was a safe, secure industry, certainly safer than where I had worked previously. It was going through a lot of disruption. So uh, every question, every answer has to be considered in terms of the context of what's going on. That makes total sense. Uh, Clark, I think you've done a great job covering a lot of these myths or lies about job hunting. After listening to this, if the audience want to learn more or uh, connect with you, how do, how, what, are the, what is the best course to reach, reach you or find more about you? Well, you know, one of the things that my wife and I believe is so important is getting valuable job search advice into the hands of job seekers at a very affordable cost. And so that's why I've written book one and book two is on the way and, and so forth. So my first recommendation would be to check out job hunting secrets from someone who's been there on Amazon. And that is, you know, readily available in uh, both paperback and Kindle. And otherwise, I would recommend connecting with me on LinkedIn. I also have 23,000 connections. So if any job seekers looking to uh, increase their network or find, you know, a way to network into referrals with other companies, those 23,000 connections are going to help them. But first and foremost, I would probably recommend the book. Because the very things that we talked about today are in that book. Awesome. I'll make sure to include those resources as links to the episode. This has been very insightful. Before we wrap up, any final words, any last words that you would love to, you, you would like to leave the audience with? Well, you know, Nisa, I've got to admit, I really say that I really have loved this as well. You know, depending upon what your schedule is, because I'm sure you're very busy with a lot of podcasting people, I even have, you know, some more information that might be of interest. We kind of talked about the hiring manager secrets earlier before we uh, started recording our message. So if you're ever interested in doing an episode on that, that's something that I would love to do. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that as well. We can definitely continue that conversation in future sessions. Sounds great. But uh, on behalf of the audience, I wanted to thank you for joining us, Clark. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nisar. Same here. Thanks everyone for listening to yet another episode of the Career Metas podcast. I have written a brief summary of the interview. And if you enjoyed this episode and also learned something new, feel free to post a comment or review. And if you really loved it, definitely go ahead and share this episode among your network. Until next time, this is Nisar Ahmed, your host for the Career Metas podcast. Thank you.